Welcome back to another episode of the Brown Air Podcast. On today's show, Southwest Airlines emergency landing in Boston, Qatar Airways to install Starlink Wi-Fi across their fleet, more info on the Singapore Airlines turbulence incident, bomb threat evacuation of Indigo flight at Delhi, Sharklets vs. Winglets, American Airlines CCO to leave the company, Turkish Airlines flight attendant injured during uh, another turbulence incident, Bark Air launches a first dog-focused airline, concerns over flight training quality for solo cross-country flights, Spirit Airlines emergency landing due to a technical issue, American Airlines plane moved by strong gusts at DFW airport, and a fatal incident at Schiphol involving a KLM engine. Hey, pal. Hey, guys. Bit of news, huh? <laughs> it's quite an interesting lineup this week. <laughs> yeah, but before we do, before we dive into the show, um, special shout out to our sponsor. Yes, Iritude. Stuff oh. is legit. This is damn fine. Work. It's legit. Ryan and I are half a bottle down of ruby spice <laughs> it's going well <laughs> yeah must say that's a it's a very unique flavor um it's very cool it it just it reminds me of uh being at the tuck shop and having those fireballs <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's very easy on the palate yeah it is and uh it's got an aviation angle aviation twist and it's got a absolute uh legend of aviation that's behind it till dave dobson so uh support our sponsor please you get a 20 percent discount well worth it but uh, jumping into the news uh there was a southwest emergency landing at the time of production now there's no more uh, news about it there was um Flight Whiskey November 5887 from Baltimore to Boston declared an emergency landing while descending into Boston. The aircraft, a 23-year-old Boeing 737-700, landed safely after scorking the emergency code 7700. They were obviously in uh, uncontrolled airspace <laughs> on that one. Uh, the cause, uh, as I said, unknown. So more on that uh, when it comes about them. The reason that I'm speaking about the story, I wanted to bring it up. The average age of the fleet there, 18.7 years, is quite old. Yeah, I mean, those for a major airline. Yeah, pretty similar to to I guess the age of the fleet that we used to fly at Saks. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, you would expect that at Saks. Yeah, yeah. But Southwest, I would have thought they would be a little bit new. I know. I mean, I'm not criticizing older aircraft, provided they maintained and all the rest. They mm. they hundreds. But uh, yeah, it just interests me that they were cl- pushing that twenty-year mark. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. I mean, I'd love to know what the what the cycles must be on airframes that are that old. I mean, that must be sitting in some higher digits there. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm. Uh, Qatar Airways Starlink in-flight Wi-Fi. This is a good one. Uh, you can expect to see that on Qatar flights in within two years. Offering speeds of 500 megabits per second for video streaming, and it'll be free across the board. Air France have quite a cool thing at the moment. It's free Wi-Fi, but I don't know how they do it. it look, it's incredibly slow, mm. and they it only lets you send a message. So you can send a WhatsApp message, an R message, or whatever, but you cannot do anything else. You can't surf the interwebs. No. Can't download a podcast. No, even, even if you sent me a picture on WhatsApp, I wouldn't be able to open the picture. Uh, that sucks. Yeah, so it keeps you connected. But like just enough. Just enough that you have to answer the message. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. can't enjoy one of their cognacs or something. Yeah, got but it. Uh, yeah, Starlink uh, makes perfect sense that it will be on all major aircraft in the in the coming years methinks yeah well shout out to Qatar airways for for taking the lead on that because i mean i don't know why more airlines aren't investigating this option i mean so obvious yeah you check these you know these van life folks and uh you know what else uh, is quite interesting have you seen how many people uh on 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 youtube are sailing around the world in their own yachts yes everyone's dived into this whole like i'm gonna get off the grid kind of vibe Mm. get onto a yacht with my girlfriend and my or my wife or my child or whatever, and we're just going to sail yeah. around the world on our yacht. Some people have been doing it for like 15 years. Isn't uh, 
what was uh, the guy's name? He was the um, he was the head of uh, the pilots' union at Spuries. I can't remember. Uh, he's done that, I think. Really? He, yeah, he's gone on a yacht and just yeah, he's gone. Yeah, I guess they're living it up, but they're not without interwebs because yeah, you have van to. life is all of them. They've all got Starlink. Yeah. So there you are, sitting in the middle of the Pacific with uh, probably no water, but you got interwebs. <laughs> yeah, you have to be able to send a <laughs> shoot out an Instagram picture or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, but Starlink is uh, it's doing its thing, man. Yeah, oh, it's the way to cool. go. Uh, pilots of Singapore flight that uh, hit that severe turbulence the other day that caused the death of a passenger. Uh, the turbulence led to a rapid altitude change, of course, flinging passengers into the air, causing serious injuries. The airline is uh, cooperating with the investigations. Uh, it looks like the skipper only put the seatbelt signs on just before no. the turbulence hit, so no doubt the easiest form of attack there will be on the poor pilots there that maybe didn't see it coming or... Yeah. But I mean, you know, turbulence it like happens. that, you know, sometimes it just hits you very suddenly. It's, uh, it's well, clear air turbulence. It's not something that... Um, it's just happening more and more. There's well, there's been lots of turbulence incidents since then. There was a... I've got it here somewhere. Let's have a look. Turbulence on a Turkish Airlines flight... Flight attendants suffered a broken back during severe turbulence. Other recent incidents involved injuries to cabin crew and passengers on Qatar. Yes. And, of course, the Singapore flight. Safety measures like suspending meal services during turbulence are being implemented in response. Is that going to solve the problem? <laughs> <laughs> turbulence isn't going away. No. <laughs> no. You know what grinds me a little bit? When you're on a long-haul flight... And I suppose this is the, the counter argument. You go through a little bit of turbulence. You have like a little bit of instability for a few minutes. And the seatbelt signs go on. For like the next two hours. Yeah. Mm. And, and that happens belt, just when you have to go and take Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it gets to a point where the seatbelt signs, the old version one Spuries used to do this when we used to fly overseas. And I know it's obviously... Uh, probably the safest way if you're not sure then just put the seatbelt signs on but the problem is after an hour and a half people are like no this is bullshit and they get up and go to the bathroom or they stand in the cabin anyway mm, yeah so it has to be realistic if you're going to leave the seatbelt signs on for the entire flight then your passengers are going to probably get up and go to the bathroom anyway a listener comment from last week martin yeah says one man's light turbulence is another man's moderate turbulence, which is another man's severe turbulence. Sometimes the seatbelt signs are on when the conditions are smooth. Sometimes the seatbelt signs are off when you're in continuous turbulence. Sometimes the cabin crew is suspended and ca cabin service is suspended and cabin crew are seated for anticipated turbulence and it turns out to be smooth. The next day the conditions are expected to be smooth, but the continuous turbulence is encountered. The result of all this is that the seatbelt sign is not taken seriously because of the inconsistency. Yeah, well said, Martin. I mean, it's the, that's the whole truth, eh? Yeah, that's so. what it's all about. Uh, bomb threat in Delhi. Aircraft was uh, evacuated due to a bomb threat. A note found at 5 o'clock local time in the laboratory read uh, bomb at 0530. <laughs> the A320 carrying 176 passengers was evacuated using the emergency slides. Video footage, of course, shared on social media. Yeah. Like bomb threats. I mean... Bomb threat. Uh, but how's that, eh? Bomb. So it's 5 o'clock and then you pick up a uh, bomb at 0, 0530. Of course, <laughs> it's, it's not funny. It's not funny. It's got to be taken seriously. But like, you know, why would there be that kind of nonsense going on in Delhi at the moment? I mean, it's a pretty peaceful part of the world. It's chaos, though. Uh, the threat was a hoax and the flight departed at 11.10. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any preference for you over winglets and sharklets? Hey, man, I like this subject because it's a bit like <laughs> talking about mags on a GTI. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they both do exactly the same thing. Yeah. And uh, Airbus, some of the Airbuses have sharklets and uh, mm. the Boeings have winglets. If it's left to me, 
he pumped my ride with him sharklets, man. Yeah. Uh, I like the sharklets. It's a cooler it name. looks cooler. Yeah. Uh, the winglets, I don't know. They're a bit duck. So they're both, retro. they both achieve similar benefits. Winglets originated in 1970s through collaboration between Boeing and NASA. Airbus began offering sharklets in 2011. Wingtip devices are more prevalent on narrow bodies, while wide bodies like the 787 are use raked wingtips. Despite variations, all aim to improve fuel efficiency and, of course, reduce drag. Uh, no significant performance difference. A little bit like a Nike versus Adidas debate. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's your... Is it the Reebok or the Nike? Your preference there. <laughs> Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Aerotude, craft alcoholic beverages and whiskey blends with a strong aviation influence. I'm excited to introduce you to their launch range, aptly named A Taste of Cape Town, which includes Beachside Days. This is a refreshing blend of Nachi, pineapple and ginger. Looks legit. Ruby Spice, a warm cinnamon whiskey blend and Feinbossity, a unique fusion of Feinboss and honey whiskey. For a limited time, Aerotude is offering our listeners a special 20% discount. Visit their website at www.aerotudebrands.co.za and enter the discount code FLYINGACE20 at checkout to enjoy this exclusive offer. Of course, all those details in the show notes support Aerotude. Uh, American Airlines CCO Vasu Raja will leave the company in June. The airline denied, uh, last week the airline denied rumors of his departure. The reason for his exit remains unclear. American Airlines lowered its quarter two financial outlook, projecting a revenue decline of up to 6%. Well, then it's obvious. Yeah. If he's projected a decline, he's probably on his way out. CEO Robert uh, Arsam mentioned ongoing adjustments to their distribution strategy during the quarter one earnings uh interesting one yeah he was part remember we read the story a few weeks ago about the american airlines are trying to encourage people to book tickets on their website mm -hmm. as far as i understand so it's like a departure away from sort of a heavy reliance, particularly in the States, of using travel, travel agents. Agent. I stole this, though, from LinkedIn this morning. A guy says, while travel agents remain crucial, the, sur the surge of meta search engines and online travel agencies is redefining the booking landscape. These platforms offer extensive invent inventories, competitive pricing, and user-friendly interfaces empowering travelers to make informed decisions and find the best value for their bookings. Personaliz personalization and innovation are driving this growth, with AI playing a pivotal role, of course. Research by Skyscanner shows a 44% increase in global travelers using AI for trip planning. The industry's revenue influenced by AI is projected to triple by 224, the end, the last quarter of 224, showcasing the significant impact of technology on the travel sector. So I like that. Yep. Well, because, that's because, you know, it's the way it's going. It's obvious, eh? But isn't it also like, all right, cool. Uh, AI will take care of most of the booking process and make it easier, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also only as good as the you AI. being able to also work with the AI mm. and, you know, put it in the, the right instructions. And And don't you think that, at the moment, that's still going to be a bit lost on a lot of people. Yeah, I think it is. I think AI is inclined. And I suppose we mentioned it on last week's show. What is it called? Google Google Flights or something. Yeah. So Google has their own online travel agent, which is, of course, working like an AI. And uh, you plug in all your details and without having to say to the AI, please find me the, the best trips at the best prices, it basically does all that search for you. Mm. So provided you put in the right details into the day you want to depart, the day you want to come back, and it kind of sorts that all out for you. But can you imagine 
obviously, let's say Google is affiliated with certain airlines and certain hotels because it does the whole thing. You know, you can mm. you can choose hotels and everything. Then it's going to obviously direct people to yeah. your particular branded airlines and hotels, which hmm. is interesting. Uh, Bark Air. Heard of this one? The first dog-focused airline launched its first flight on the 23rd of May from Westchester to Van Nuys in LA. The Gulfstream G5 carried six dogs and 11 humans, costing 6,000 USD per ticket for one dog and one human companion. The airline promoted by Josh Groban prioritizes dogs' comfort, offering flights between New York, LA, and London without restrictions on size, weight, or breed. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that the restrictions on the dog or the passengers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 6,000 USD, I suppose, on a... I was, when I saw that, it's uh, pr- that I, price, it's I was like, holy shit. But then you go back and read it, it's a Gulfstream G5, so it makes sense. It's a G5, and it's, uh, it's, it's also... Some of those flights are quite long. So... Yeah, New York to Van Ars, I mean, that's basically coast to coast in the states yeah and uh la to london yes yes. so so i suppose six thousand yeah josh groban smiling all the way to the bank (laughs) josh groban (laughs) bark air uh the semi boss is big into his animals yeah Yeah. so maybe but i think you you can take you can take dogs on the semi flights you can you can yeah. yeah there's actually quite a few airlines are opening up to that now um you know Take your dog on board, which is cool. I mean, so Miles, these are like stole your idea. <laughs> Charging more for it. Yeah. 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 I think the thing here is that it's a specific dog flight. And it's, it's uh, even more than that, it's specific to a yeah. dog airline in the first place. Look, my, my dogs, I know for certain, would be quite chuffed with the fact that they're on a G5 as opposed to a Global Express, but that's just my dogs and snobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll be quite cool to see that actually. Mm. Uh, flight students often feel unprepared for solo cross-country flights due to rush training and in- inadequate instruction. Instructors are concerned about a trend in part 141 programs where solo cross-country experience is being minimized. This leads to lack of essential navigation skills like uh, dead reckoning and using an E6B flight computer. Can you use one of those? Yeah, I can actually. C- <laughs> CFRs should emphasize these skills early, ensure proper ground instruction and teach learners to manage flight plans and understand their limitations to build confidence and competence. Um, this article came out of uh, Flying Magazine and it's quite a cool it's quite a cool website actually because there's quite a lot of stories like us. I, lot, I know a lot of the people that listen to us are at the beginning of their flying career. Mm-hmm. And uh, this website, Flying Magazine, has got some, uh, some nice stories there. Well, well worth a look if you, if you want to check it out. But uh, the main reason I brought it up was um, <laughs> it, it, it brought me back. When I was doing my... PPL in Port Elizabeth. We had to do a nav from Progress Flight Academy to, I think it was, um, to where was on that side? Could be Grahamstown and then to Henry's Flats. There's <laughs> this place called Henry's Flats. Yeah. Okay, it was like, a, if, I, if I remember correctly, I can still sort of see it on the map, you know, yeah. those ridiculous maps. And um, I remember bombing along there, and I'm, you're by yourself. It's a solo cross. It's quite yeah. a quite a big thing. Yeah. When you is it doing your PPL? Or doing yeah, your, doing your PPL. Your PPL. You're supposed to do that without a GPS. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I, this was I, this was actually what 2000 or so, 2001. So it mm. didn't have there wasn't a GPS. None. Yeah. Only the a couple of oaks had handheld <laughs> things. And I remember saying to the approach controller at PE. Uh, can you give me some radar vector scan these flats? <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't know where it was. Eh? The guy was like, uh, yeah, bro, we don't really have those coordinates on the radar. <laughs> but you're looking good to get back to, to PE. So I think I pulled one of those uh, 
let me just shoot back to progress and land and then tell the instructor, yeah, yeah, I went to Olaka there over Henry's flat. So <laughs> I think a lot of guys. <laughs> I, did, I did, did it three hours of orbiting in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, it can shit. be quite a hair-raising experience in an airplane for the non-aviators watching where you're flying this light aircraft mm. with very basic instrumentation and you actually don't know where you are. Well, I, I had to do that in AVEX when I did my instructors yeah. last year. And uh, shit, man. I mean, that was an eye opener. And I, I kind of went and did it for fun. Was pulled out that map, got out the old E6B and planned this whole thing. But I mean, yes, it's old school. It's it's way easier now to whip out the iPad and you've got uh, apps like Sky Demon and all this. And you just download an app. You've got all the GPS functionality. You just use that and go. Yeah. <laughs> We'll put it this way. You will not catch me doing one of those again <laughs> without a <laughs> sophisticated GPS on board. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Spirit Airlines, November Kilo 270 from Montego Bay to Fort Lauderdale. They experienced a technical issue after takeoff. The passengers were told to prepare for a water landing. The Airbus A321neo returned safely to Montego Bay minutes after departure. Spirit Airlines stated the mechanical issue did not affect the flight safety and a replacement aircraft was transported and sorted out uh, a 320 and a water landing <laughs> he thinks his captain was looking for some uh, <laughs> sky time on uh, on instagram oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> was that uh remember that um that rip off with uh, all the tom hanks and uh, was it alec baldwin where they're like you know do you know who i am <laughs> i'm <Yeah>. telling you <laughs> one of those vibes yeah. exactly oh, shit uh, not nice for a passenger, though, to be told to prepare for a water landing. No. Uh, there was another incident. I don't think there were any packs on board. Did you see it? There was a video that came out. Uh, it was a American Airlines, I think, at DFW. 737-800. Yeah. 77 mile an hour gusts. And the, the aircraft basically got separated from the the air stairs. <laughs> hey? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. The, it was, uh, yeah, it moved 90 degrees away. It's quite a wild video, actually, that came out. Let me see if I can bring it up. But uh, it just seems to me like around the world, we've got all these turbulence incidents. We've had uh, multiple, uh, lots of sort of mini incidents that have that have happened. Mm. The weather just seems to be getting more and more wild around the world. No, there's nothing up. You can just pick up the actual, uh, yeah. Nothing. There's no video. It's just the pictures of the... No video. It's hectic. 77 miles an hour. You're not going to be flying your kite in there. No. And then uh, just that other video, the other one I was talking about is, uh, yeah, this website. Pretty cool, actually. Uh, nice, well-written articles, business and military stuff as well. But a lot of these sort of uh, stuff for, for entry level, quite cool. And, and worth worth looking at. Uh, this was a nasty one. A fatal incident occurred at Amsterdam when a person fell into the running engine of an Embraer 190. The incident happened at uh, 3 o'clock local time. Investigation by the Royal Military Police is ongoing. Emergency response teams acted promptly. Passengers and crew safely disembarked. But, uh, yeah, condolences to the victim's family and all that going on pretty nasty yeah, i think like it's happened a lot i mean how does it how does yeah. it happen <sighs> but you know walk in front of an engine that's on yes <laughs> hectic yeah um some counseling required i think yeah and a compressor wash yeah or a bottle of aerotude <laughs> <laughs> time for an advisory it is um so you enjoy the high performance podcast like I do. Eh? I absolutely love it. Jake, Jake and Damon, very, very cool. And they always start the show, they always say, uh, what does high performance yeah. mean to you? And a lot of the time the guest answers about, you know, doing your best and you know, preparation and things like that. And um, I gave it a bit of thought because last week you and I were both in a situation where – yeah, we were. It was a it was a rough was a rough week, and uh, when we got together for the pod, when we did the pod, we actually yeah that was cool. And 
when I rewatched some of the stuff back, I thought, yes, I, I, something wrong with me in this bloody pot. I looked exhausted, you know. No, I was, you were, you we were, were pretty just tired. But it got me thinking, you know, what is what does doing your best actually mean? And uh, I think we mistake it sometimes to think that doing your best means performing the best you possibly can. Mm. But I think it needs to be reshaped a bit. I think it's performing the best you can under the circumstances at the time. Um, you know, you don't need to master every self-improvement tip out there. What truly matters is what? Consistency. Mm. So it's okay to have your off days. It's okay to not be at the top of your game. The key is just showing up. Keep putting in the effort and stay committed to your goals. It's easy to get despondent when uh, things aren't going your way. But, uh, you know, this advisory, like most of the advisories, is, is not my sole idea here. But I'd end off with the advisory to say that a lot of the time with everything that's out there these days, we're inclined to look at other people and say, look at this person performing in that way. And we kind of, it can bring you down because you think, geez, man, you know, we got together for the podcast, didn't make as good of a podcast as we really wanted to. And then it, it kind of weighs you down on the weekend and say, oh, we didn't, we didn't perform at our best. We didn't do our best. But uh, the one I like here, it says the only competition we have is with the person we were yesterday and not who someone else is today. So just to remind yourself that you're actually not competing with that other podcaster or this other, mm. this other businessman or whatever it is. You're actually only competing with yourself 24 hours ago. Yeah. And as long as the person here is uh, doing better than that guy, then you're golden. So uh, I kind of like that one. Sage advice, and it's actually, I think it's such an important time to, you know, have an advisory like that now because I think a lot of people are on the same wavelength with that, you know. Mm. We're in a time now where there's a lot of competition out there. There's a, there's a big drive for everyone to be performing and doing their best to, you know, yeah. get somewhere and, and, and reach those goals. And uh, I think you can often find yourself running into a bit of fatigue by trying to you know, knock these goals out and then you start feeling like, shit, what am I doing this for? Uh, because you get waylaid by looking at what everyone else is doing and comparing yourself to them. But yeah, yeah don't ever forget that uh, you are you, your you are number one. And yeah, you got you to, you know, like you say, be better than yourself the next day. Plans for the weekend? <sighs> to be better. <laughs> <than I was yesterday>. <laughs> <laughs> better than you were last weekend the weekend you're off yeah yep. yeah no, nothing else planned um, time with the kiddies is there sport this weekend no not that I know of no mm. Formula 1 jeez did you watch Monaco <laughs> I told you was, uh, it wasn't all going to be go Max's way no it wasn't like, he was actually nowhere he wasn't I mean uh, it, it, it was all it worked out perfectly for the clerk um, now there seems to be a proper season there. I know that track really doesn't suit the Red Bull and the, the yeah. other tracks where the Red Bull will be dominant, but that McLaren is looking really good and that Ferrari seems to make a, ste a step forward. So Formula One, a good time to get in it at the moment if you're not watching. I think it's uh, going to yeah. be a good rest of the season. Uh, definitely. I think what's left of the year is going to be interesting to watch, especially now that uh, you know Leclerc and uh, Max are getting close yeah, you know, uh, with, they're within reach in, in terms of points. Yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be good. And uh, what's happening in terms of uh, UFC? Some big fights coming up in June, July. Huh? Yeah, there's UFC. If I, I must check it now, I think Dustin Poirier is fighting this weekend. Actually, let's have a look. Um, and he's fighting Mahachev in UFC three zero two. Let me pull it up here. The UFC's got some major, major events now coming up. There's uh, Connors fighting Chandler a bit later on. I think that's a uh, month after next. Mm -hmm. And then we've got uh, our very own Drikus yeah. will be taking on Adesanya in um, Sydney. Yeah, that's, that's, that's in that, August. That's, eh? that's going to be in August. Is yeah. it August or September? 
Oh, it could be. Yeah. Anyways, there's a few good fights coming up. But yeah, you do bring up a point, and I'm trying to uh, see here. But I think we've actually got uh, Mahachev and Poria this weekend. Okay, well, that's going to be something to watch. And check, I got the cast off my finger. <laughs> it's about <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I have a... Uh, yeah, hang on before it's come up. Yeah. Sunday, 2nd of June. Islam Mahachev versus uh, Dustin Poirier. Nice. Yeah, and uh, the co-main is Sean Strickland versus Paolo Costa. So, yeah, legit. And the middleweight, Kevin Holland. Yeah, that's actually a very, very good. Yeah, good good on reminding you there, Paul. Like a lineup then for Sunday. Yeah, that's going to be legit. <laughs> I did have plans for Sunday morning. I don't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just when you thought you were going to sleep in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But nice. That's going to be a cracker. Cool. Uh, we love the show. We're going to carry on doing it. You'll see more of us. Cheers for now. 100%.